She is the Library of Congress's national ambassador for young people's literature. Over the last 14 years, she's distinguished herself writing for children. The recipient of the Newbery Honor and two Newbery Medals, sort of the Academy Awards of Kids Lit. My next guest is the author of some incredible works, Because of Wind dixie The Tale of Despero, The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, and many others. Her work is moving, soulful, and filled with redemption. I spent some time talking with Kate DiCamello at the National Book Festival here in D.C. We chatted about the source of her fiction, her tips for getting kids to read, and something dear to my heart, the importance of stories. Here's an encore of my conversation with author Kate DiCamello. Madam Ambassador, I want to start with, <laughs> you, you have really been on a, on a crusade, if you will, to inspire young people to read. And through your work, you've already done that. I was telling you a little bit ago about my nine-year-old who was in tears at the end of Edward Tulane. Which made me cry, so we were off to a good start. What yeah. is it about stories that are necessary for not only children but adults? Necessary for all of us. Um, I think that particularly with kids, but also with adults, it gives you a way, it gives you a language to talk about things that you know instinctually, but you might not have the words for it. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that your daughter told you the whole story, you asked the why she was crying. Saga. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that that's the very thing right there. She's deeply moved and she can say why because she has the language of story to say mm -hmm. it in. Yeah, it, do, it really does give them a compass almost to to take on the world and all the things that they will encounter. Well, you're, you're using, that's, I loved, I, it's a compass, it's a blueprint, it's a map, it's uh -huh. a way to, it's a microscope, it's a telescope. Mm -hmm. That's what story is. So, Kate DiCamello, looking at your career. And uh, it's career. A, it, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in your, in your body of work. Um, I, I've been reading a lot of interviews, and you put persistence above talent. You believe that's more important. Why? I remember being in writing groups and having somebody much more talented to the left of me and to the right of me. And I knew, I watched them as they proceeded. You need to be able to take rejection after rejection after rejection. And then once you get accepted, you need to be able to take criticism after criticism to make it better. And that's all persistence. And I thought, I can't make myself more talented. I can make myself do the work and I can make myself not give up. And mm. Now I'm sitting here talking to you. Oh, so, please. Yeah. Madam Ambassador, this is my, <laughs> this is my honor, not yours. Uh, talk about your process for a little bit. Two pages a day. That's all you do. Right, Why not much. Why do you much. restrict yourself to just that? Um, I, when I began, because I spent, it was a long time before I began, I, oh, yeah. I, for almost 10 years, I was in college, a professor said, direct quote, you have a certain facility with words, you should consider graduate school. Hmm. And at 20, I thought that he was trying to tell me that I was wildly talented huh. and that I was going to be a rich and famous writer. So I thought, why bother with graduate school, <laughs> right? <laughs> why right bother with graduate school? And so I, I spent the next decade talking about being a writer, wanting to be a writer, telling people that I was a writer, wearing black turtlenecks, looking disengaged and, and, and like disdainful. So you were halfway there. <laughs> right, the only thing I wasn't doing was writing, well, you know? Yeah, so, and when I started, I thought, uh, I, at the time that I started, I was running. I could make myself run two miles a day, and I thought, here's this thing that I say matters to me more than anything else, so I'll just say I'm gonna do two pages a day. Two huh. miles a day, two pages a day. That's and you do it every day, no more than that? Uh, Even it, on when days? I'm in the. <laughs> no, you, you know that Hemingway thing about you want to be nice to the you that exists the next day. So if it's oh. a hot day, you stop oh. so that it'll be easier to pick it up the mm -hmm. next morning. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've, uh, I've been there. <laughs> I haven't observed that rule. I come cold that next day, you know. <laughs> but boy, I, I got three pages the, next, the, the, the day before. Tell me about the origin stories, if you will, about that. My children and I have been talking about these, these stories. They cross genres. These characters are very dissimilar from Despero to Edward Tulane. Start with Winn-Dixie, your breakthrough book. Um, such a beautiful, in some ways, painful book. Um, it is. Tell yeah, me about that book, where it came from. Um, I grew up in Florida, mm -hmm. and um, right before I started to write, I moved to Minnesota, and I wrote Winn-Dixie um, the second winter there, which was one of the, the worst, worst winners on record. Last year was yeah. was a contender, well, yeah. I have to part say. Part two. <laughs> right, part two. Um, and so I was homesick 
for Florida. I couldn't go home. I didn't have enough money to go home. And also, it was the first time in my life I'd been without a dog. Um, and so I made a dog up. And all of this is looking back in retrospect. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I was just feeling my way through the story. But that is, that's the origin. And I can look back and say that. Uh, there's a lot of um, abandonment disappointment in these stories. Despero's mother's disappointed with him. Um, at one point, uh, uh, Abilene's grandmother is disappointed in Edward. It seems to be a theme, huh? What is yeah. it? Where does that come from? It does linger uh, over the world. That's the only common denominator I see here. That and friendship. Yeah. And there's and always, yes. Wow, you have done your homework. No, my kids have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just <laughs> listen made... to them and read along. Yeah. Those things keep on showing up. Why the disappointment? I don't know. I, I exist perpetually uh, in fear that I will disappoint. Um, I don't know where it comes from, but it certainly ends up in those stories. I have been saved by wonderful friendships in my life, and I have found forgiveness and redemption and stories in those friendships. So. Wow. Where, where did Edward Tulane come from? Someone gave you a little yes, China bunny? Yes, I was gonna say, again, you've done your research. Yeah, a, a big China, oh, wow. a big actually melamine, which doesn't Ooh. have quite the resonance as a word that, yeah, China, that China does. does yeah. yeah, so it's a rabbit made out of melamine, dressed very elegantly, and um, kind of a creepy rabbit. Well, tell me about that book. There's been a lot written about it. There has and been. And when you read it, he spends 40 days and 40 nights in the garbage dump. Um, he, uh, he, he has essentially a last supper before he's cast out. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, tell me about the um, biblical overtones there. Um, I, all unwitting, I, it's, it's like I can look back and see all of that. None of that is conscious on my part. When people point it out to me, this is the beauty of critics and teachers <laughs> and librarians. Yeah. It's like people will tell you mm -hmm. what is in your book, but it's not always something that I can see until it's mm -hmm. done and the book is out in the world. So mm -hmm. I'm working on an instinctual kind of basis and plugging into something larger and better than I am. Animals are very frequent in these works. Yeah. They, they are everywhere. What do animals represent to you? We were talking about Dean Koontz a little while ago. Yeah. Dean has, has, uh, has always had these Labrador retrievers. He believes they're almost like guardian angels. Yeah, I would, yes. And, and, and almost every book that I've done has an animal in it. And it's gotten to the point where I think I should not put an animal in there, but it, they keep on showing up. And it's, I think for me, they provide a, as a writer, a level of safety and comfort. It's mm. what I loved as a child. And I think mm. as readers, we're much more inclined to open our heart to an animal protagonist. We trust more quickly there. Yeah, no, and you, and I know recently, uh, you, you've, you've returned, if you will, to your Mercy Watson roots. Mercy Watson is this lovable pig. Yes. Uh, that, that was part of a, a picture book series. Now you're, you've really done a spinoff. Yeah. Tell me about this. <laughs> right, and I didn't, you know, I... And it's I not an animal. It, it, well, there is an animal in it, though. You know, see, because I can't help myself. <laughs> it just keeps on happening. There's a horse in it named yeah. Maybelline. Um, so there are all these secondary characters in those Mercy Watson books, and I thought, I missed Mercy, and I and I thought I want to do more and how can I do more in a different way? So I thought I'll take these secondary characters and tell their stories. So this is Leroy Ninker, a reformed thief. <laughs> he stole a toaster from the Watson household. I want to be cowboy. Right, and he also wants to be a cowboy and he gets a horse that he hopes when he goes to purchase this horse that the horse's name is going to be Tornado instead. It is Maybelline. Maybelline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and mayhem ensues. Tell me, when you start a new project, are you still trepidatious? Are you still fearful? Oh, I am fear incarnate right here. This is me. Yeah, I'm always terrified. And I don't, I've learned to not wish that away. It, um, it's part of the whole thing for me. It's, the, I don't ever know what's going to happen in a story. It's the no wonderful, outlining. no, it's that Elmer Leonard quote, if I knew what was going to happen, I wouldn't write the story. I write to find out. Wow. And that has a certain element of fear in it, but also self-discovery. So wow. it's just the way it is. It's right? so scary to me. I just finished my first children's book and it, it took me years. 
But I had to outline this thing. I couldn't imagine. But everybody works blind. differently. I mean, I have so many friends who write, and there are some people that would never think about doing a novel without outlining first. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I've tried, and as soon as I outline it, I don't want to write it. It's dead to you. Yeah, exactly. It's so something. there's no right way. I and congratulations on your book. Well, uh, you're, well, read it first. You may not be so congratulatory, <laughs> but I'll send you a copy. Uh, E.B. White had that great line that writing is an act of faith, not an act of grammar. Uh, do you I didn't know that? that line. I love that. And I love E.B. White, yeah, so thank you. One of the most beautiful writers. Say it again. Uh, Say it. He, and, uh, writing is an act of faith, not an act of grammar. Right. But you need to use the grammar to get to the faith. Right. <laughs> does, your, does your personal faith ever work its way into the works? All of me works its way in there. Uh, the mm -hmm. whole of me is revealed on the page. Anybody who is mm -hmm. writing necessarily reveals himself even when they think that they're hiding. So every part of me mm -hmm. is on there. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've, I'm going to start this new literacy campaign. It's called Rays of Wonder, which kind of aligns nicely with your work. What would be your advice to parents and to the kids themselves about encouraging this lifelong love of reading and reading nourishing works, not just comic books. I've interviewed others who said, oh, if they're reading comic book, that's fine. Let them read anything. Do you agree with that? I say let them start wherever they want to start mm -hmm. and they'll find their way. Mm -hmm. But as far as, and now I get to put on the ambassadorial, Not is that an, an idea, hat and say reading together, um, letting your children see you reading a book for your own pleasure, mm -hmm. not making it a task, making it uh, a privilege yeah. and a joy and a celebration and also just a way to engage with each other, have your child read to you, you read to your child. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so many people, you know, 15 minutes you have to read. Don't, don't yeah. do that. Yeah, why? You, you get to read. You get to read. It is an absolute privilege, and there is nowhere in this country that you can't go and get a book. We have libraries mm. everywhere. It's available to everybody, and it's a privilege. Mm. Kate DiCamillo, this has been a privilege for me and for us. Thank you. Thank, and thank you. thank you for your work. Beautiful. Thank you. Before we go, I'm planning to launch a brand new literacy initiative, one that will recommend wondrous and nourishing works for kids and their families. But I need your help. If you're an educator or a librarian, or perhaps a very well-read parent, who'd like to submit a list of your favorite books and perhaps become an ongoing contributor to my new site, I want you to drop me an email. I'm at raymond at raymondarroyo.com. It's easy to remember. Put books in the subject line. I would love to hear you about your reading lists and your tips for getting kids to read. I've got a big announcement coming soon, and I'll share this initiative with you, so stay tuned for that, and thank you for participating. Finally, I've always believed if you have access to the public, you should use it to do some good. This week, I received a number of prayer requests from people who are facing very difficult situations. And I ask you to remember them in your prayers. A viewer wrote me about her friend, Kath Heffernan, who's battling non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You keep fighting. And two personal friends are contending with cancer, Kathy Morrison in Williamsburg and my pal John in New Orleans. I thank you for keeping all of these folks in your thoughts and your prayers.